to First Chronicles. Grab your Bible, turn to First Chronicles. Give me a mobile. First Chronicles. Thank you. I'm up here turning, telling you guys to, to get your Bibles, and I even have mine. <laughs> Thank you. Grab your Bibles and turn to First Chronicles, <clears throat> chapter four. As we have stated earlier, Pastor is away. He's uh, at Freedom Baptist Church in Twenty Nine Palms, helping Pastor Minnick. I'm taking over their services for today. So you guys are stuck with me for today. <laughs> if you turn your guys' uh, Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 4. Now let me get there. First of all, I, w- I would like to thank Pastor. He's not here, but I'd like to thank him for giving me the opportunity to preach and to open his word and uh, to teach what thus saith the Lord. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10 says, <clears throat> Oh my. First Chron- Oops, I'm in 2 Chronicles. My bad. Lord help me. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse number 10. It says, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him his request, or that which he requested. Jabez asked for God's hand of blessing on his life. Because Jabez understood that God was the only one who could grant him this request at his will. Some people work their whole entire lives to build their territory and enlarge their own coast. Whereas Jabez understood that God is the only one who could enlarge his coast and enlarge his territory. That he might be a blessing and that it might keep him from evil. See, Jabez had a spiritual reason as to why he needed his uh, coast enlarged. And that reason was that that evil might not grieve him and that God's hand would be with him. Most people seek the territory and seek the enlargement, but don't necessarily want the things of God or the things that should come with it. And uh, if you'll you'll turn over to Acts uh, 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. It says, in Acts 4.29, it says, <clears throat> Acts 4.29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. In the context of chapter 4, it's Peter in the, in the upper room, and they were prophesying and talking um, to, the, to the men that stood there. But then they didn't, the, the children of Israel didn't like what they were saying, and Peter asked God to behold their threatenings and to give and stretch down his hand that they might declare the word boldly. Peter saw what they were saying, what the enemy was saying, and the threatenings that they were making, and asked God to not take it away, but to create them, to make them even bolder in the midst of the threatenings. He never said, God, take away their threatenings. It's too much for me. He said, God, give me the increased strength that I need and boldness to declare in the midst of all their threatenings. So if Jabez and, and Peter understood something that w- I would like to get across for us today. They understood that without God's power and without God's will, without God's hand, they are very helpless indeed. And today, I would like to talk about a little bit, something a little bit different, where God's hand 
uh, we, we see God's hand throughout all the Bible, and you hear a lot of messages about God's hand and Lord, you know, come down and touch us. And, but this, the emphasis that I want to make is on actually Jesus' hand and not God's, which I and my Father are one. I understand that. God is Jesus, and Jesus is God. But the emphasis of the actual Jesus and his ministry on earth. And I want to take a really close look and focus in on what Jesus did with his hands while he was here on this, on this earth. But first, I would like to, like Peter, ask for God's boldness upon me and us that we might keep us from evil, like Jabez said. And that for me, that I might declare God's word boldly for this message today. Let's pray. Lord, help me to be clear. God, help me to be clear. Help me to think clearly, Lord, and um, give rid of my uh, nerves, Lord, whatever they be, um, and help me to um, have a clear mind and speak what thus saith the Lord. Help me to be bold, Lord, um, and help me to get my points across that I'm trying to, trying to get across, Lord. Help the people, Lord. Help them to be um, kept from all evil, Lord. Keep the distractions and uh, help clear our minds, Lord. Help us to focus and hone in for this short amount of time to really pay attention and to see what we can get from your word, Lord. Um, You said that your word will not return voids, Lord. So help me to speak your word and help me to be clear and uh, help the rest of the service to be awesome, Lord. And uh, just come down and put your hand upon us, Lord, and uh, that we might be kept from evil and that we can declare your word with all boldness, Lord. Help us through the rest of this sermon, Lord. Help me to um, be effective and uh, rightly divide the word of truth, God. And dear Lord, amen. If you'll turn your, uh, your Bibles to Matthew, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to read a familiar story in Matthew chapter 8 of Jesus touching the leper. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. Matthew chapter 8 says, and 1 through 3 says, When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. For verses 1 through 3, we can see that although Jesus was currently, quote unquote, busy, you see in verse number 1, it says, And when he was came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. We see that he stopped to help one leper who was crying out and worshiping him and who asked for God's help. See, the leper understood that he could not by himself and in and of himself heal himself and that he needed God. So when he got the opportunity, he cried out to Jesus, although he was, quote unquote, busy with the multitude. He cried out in faith, asking if that God would heal him. And we can see in verse number two, uh, uh, in verse number three, sorry, and Jesus put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. See, from verses uh, 1 through 2, we can see that although he was currently busy, Jesus is never too busy to help you. In fact, the Bible says he never sleeps, he never slumbers. And although where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst, there can be a lot of two or threes in this whole world, and he can be in the midst of all of them. (laughs) Because God is everywhere. And he's always hearing from his heaven. He can always hear our prayers when we are praying to him. And although he's dealing with a whole lot that goes in the world, he's always available for us to call upon him. Jesus often helped the quote-unquote singles, although they weren't necessarily unmarried. I'm just talking about the individuals in his ministry. That was supposed to be funny, but nobody laughed, except for Abel. No, but... (laughs) Although he did help the individuals in his ministry, oftentimes Jesus gets very personal. And we can see this with several examples. This uh, example right here, Nicodemus, when Nicodemus came to him by night, the woman at the well. And so many other examples where Jesus helps one individual. In 
In Isaiah 55, verse 6, it says to seek the Lord while he may be found. Also in Romans 17, chapter 20, uh, verse number 27, Paul states that Jesus is not far from any one of us. God is always available to give us his hand of mercy and his touch when we ask him and while he seek while he may be found. Uh, in verse number three, we see that Jesus must put forth his hand. Uh, Jesus put forth his hand to change his life, and immediately he was cleansed from his leprosy. But we also see in many other passages of Scripture that God does not always do it this way. We see God's timing is as, uh, as he sees fit moves in our lives. God, in his timing, as he sees fit, moves in our lives. We can see this in Matthew 14, verse 21, uh, 28 through 31, uh, where Peter cries, Lord, save me. And immediately God reaches forth down and saves him. But in contrast to this, we see in Luke 17, verse 11 through 19, it says that, <clears throat> it says that he told the 10 lepers to go and to go to the priest um, when they asked for his healing, when they saw him afar off. So, Peter asked for help in over, uh, over here and immediately got stretched for his hand and caught him. But then in contrast, then the ten leopards asked for the Lord, same thing as in this chapter, ten leopards instead of one, but they asked for God's help and he says, go to the priest. He told them to take a process and actually didn't even touch them at all. And as we see from this verse, it's not because he wasn't afraid to touch a leper, obviously. But God doesn't always work in everybody's lives the same way. Um, <clears throat> Peter and we know that Jesus was our friend. God doesn't always uh, if you turn over to, to chapter uh, 9 John chapter 9 man God help me John chapter 9 John chapter 9 1 through 7 states and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. I must work, uh, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. From this passage of scripture, we can see that first, uh, from, from Matthew, we see that God touches us. But from this passage of scripture, we can see that God touches objects. As we continue on, verse number six, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam which is by the interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seen. So we see in, in, in Matthew, the leper asks for help, and God touches him and heals him. In this passage of scripture, we see that a blind man comes and asks for God, uh, uh, that God passes by a blind man, and then spits in the ground, makes clay, and uses the clay to put onto his eyes, with then telling him to go wash himself. Number one, that's disgusting. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't because it's God's spit, but still, spit is spit, and spit is nasty. Um, so first of all, that's gross. But we might see that as gross, but in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 27 says that God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So even though it doesn't make any sense at all whatsoever to me, it doesn't matter. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And we see that God didn't touch him necessarily. I mean, obviously he did. He anointed his eyes. But he used the objects to help him. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. God used the objects in this man's life to heal this man instead of actually touching and putting his hand on him specifically. So we see that God uses and God puts his hand on us, us or our lives. God puts his hands on objects in our lives. Or thirdly, if you'll turn over to um, Luke chapter 22, it says 
<clears throat> Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 47. Luke chapter 22, verse 47 states, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he, and he was called Judas, one of his twelve, was before him, and drew near to kiss him. But when he said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou, uh, I think I'm in the right chapter. Luke 22, through his hand was, oh, no, I'm in the right chapter. My goodness. Luke chapter 22, verse 27, uh, 47 says, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was with, uh, and he, mm, my goodness, God help me. Verse 47, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And they, when they were about him, Saw, and when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus said unto him, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. We see thirdly that Jesus and his hands are on his, our enemies. Not only does he touch our lives, not only does he touch the objects around us, but sometimes he touches our enemies. And we can see, <clears throat> and we can see Jesus from verse number 40, uh, 49 to wait for God's answer instead of immediately rushing into battle with our sword. They asked him a question, shall we smite? And before even God even gave them the answer, immediately they just kind of ran out with their swords and cut off his ear. So I have a challenge for you. If you do run out with your sword, at least kill the guy. No, I'm just kidding. No, but, I mean, his ear? Come on. No, I'm just messing. But, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But we ought to wait for God's answer when we do, um, when we do ask for God's, uh, when we ask for God a question, we ought to wait for his answer. And we can see that they did not. But even while we don't, we can see from verse number uh, uh we can see verse, from verse number 41, uh, 51, and he touched his ear and healed him. God is able to still fix our mistakes even after we make them. God is able to fix our mistakes even after we make them. And although while we still have the memory of failing, and although we still have the mind's eye of what actually took place, God's still able to fix what we can go. And Paul says in uh, Philippians 3 that we ought to forget those things which are behind, but to press forward, uh, but, but to press, forgetting those things which are behind, and uh, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forth into, I'm skipping a whole part, whatever, but you get the idea. Uh, Philippians, actually, I'm just going to turn there. Philippians 3, uh, verse 13, it says, forgetting those things which are behind, and pressing toward unto the mark. My goodness. Philippians 3, verse 13 says, I don't want to butcher it. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, yes, I've made a lot of mistakes. Yes, I've made a whole lot of blunders. But I forget those things which are behind and press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. Why does God put his hand on us? And why does God put his hand on objects around us? And why does God put his hands on our enemies? The simple answer to this question is because God wants to use us and God wants to hold us in his hand. If we were to be honest, we would all say that we can see God's hand in our life. And if we are saved, we are in his hand. Quick commercial. If you don't know Christ as your savior, we can get that settled right now. We can get that settled today. If you don't know that you're in God's hand, we could settle that right now. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. <clears throat> John 
John chapter 10 states, uh, verse number 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We can see from this passage of Scripture that God calls us sheep, and that when He calls, we know His voice, and He knows them that are His. And He also says that He holds us in His hands. You see, if we are saved today, and we are God's sheep, we are being held in God's hand, and no man can pluck us out. By the way, these are the same hands that touched the leper to make him clean before charging him to tell no man. But it was just too much good to keep to himself. These are the same hands that grabbed Peter and wondered why Peter was still of so small faith even after everything that they had seen together. These are the same hands that he showed to his disciples after raising from, rising from the grave. And this is the first time that they had seen him since they had forsook him in the garden, most of them. And these are the same hands that he told Thomas to reach thither thy finger and to thrust into his side, that he might not waver, but wholly believe. These are the same hands that hold the seven stars and the reins of the white horse, whose rider is also called Faithful and True. These are the same hands that holds you and me and holds those that are his. But it gets even better than that. Because not only are we in Jesus' hands, and not only have all those things that Jesus has done for us, not only are, uh, all, and everything that his hands have been through, not only those hands are the hands that hold us, but we are also being held by the Father. And those are the same hands that formed Adam, the very first man. And those are the same hands that covered Moses' eyes while he walked by to prevent Moses from being killed by his glory. Those are the same hands that grabbed Ezekiel from the locks of his head to show him the visions of God and that, uh, the, and so that and shows him the visions of God that were provoking him, uh, his, him to jealousy because of his people were leaving him. Those were the same hands that smote the Israelites for the abominations that they were doing. For God is a just God, and he wants all of us to be vessels of honor. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every one, every son, when he receive, uh, whom he receiveth. Hebrews 17.6 uh, uh, And when you show God, and when you allow God to purge you, of the same hands, uh, those same hands will uphold the righteous, Isaiah 41.10. And the same hands that gave all things to Jesus to hold in his hands are the same hands that cover Jesus' hands and holds us. God has done absolutely everything under the sun, and he's made absolutely everything. And with those hands, he has promised to hold us and to hold us fast. And Jesus has also promised that he will also hold us. So it's kind of like if I were to hold something in my hand and then angel were to come up and put his hands around my hands. And he says, nobody can pluck you out of my father's hand. And even if they did, my hands are holding you and nobody can pluck you out of my hands. So God says twice that no man can pluck you out of their hands. And they're both holding you at the same time. That's quite the promise. Let me ask you a question today. Are you in God's hands? Are you allowing God to use your life? Are you allowing God to do whatsoever he will in your life? Or are you like the sheep, the one sheep who left the 99 going out from the fold and having God to leave the 99 and come and find you? Are you still wandering Who's calling you every time the other sheep around you abruptly raise their head and look toward their master? And you're wondering what that call is? That's God's call. God said that they, my sheep know my voice and that he knows them. While the other sheep are 
hearing God's voice and you're not sure what voice that is, are you still wondering? God can, can save you and let you know that you are saved. For the Bible says that I may know, that ye, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God doesn't want us to go through life thinking we are in his hand or hoping that we are in his hand or just asking God to touch us every time we need him. God actually wants us to stay in his hands and to be in his hands. And by the way, when you do get saved, no man can pluck me out is including you because you're a man. So we can't even remove ourselves out of his hands. That's why I wanted to get us to 2 Timothy 2 where it says, if we believe not, he is faithful. He cannot deny himself. If he's promised to hold us in his hands, then he's going to hold us in his hands, no matter what, because he's gave us that promise, and he can't deny himself. Titus says that God that cannot lie. God has given us his promise, and he cannot lie. But are you in his hand? Are you in his hand? You can know the promise, the Bible says that the devils believe and tremble. You can know all about God's word. You can know all about God's hand. You can know every miracle that God has ever done. But that does not mean you're in his hand. You have to make a personal decision to be in God's hand. You have to purposely, on purpose, say, Lord, I'm all yours. Although you can't leave his hand, for the sake of illustration, Stay in his hand. If you've gotten in his hand, don't leave. Now, you can't leave. But the point that I'm trying to make is stay in God's will. Now, I understand that it's very difficult to do right. I should know because I do wrong a lot. It's very hard to do right. But if we are to stay in God's hand, he promises that he will hold us up. And that if we wait upon the Lord... He will renew our strength. The points that I'm trying to make for, ver, uh, for point one, two, and three is that God is using all these points. He's, he's, he's touching you. He's touching objects around you. And he's touching your enemies because he wants to hold you in his hand. Are you in God's hand today? And if you're not, we can get that settled. Don't waver. I've been there. It's absolutely torturous. It's horrible, and it's sin. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Every time the preacher says to do something and you don't do it, or he calls you and says, if, you're, if you don't believe that you're saved or you're doubting, we can get it settled right now, and you know that's the right thing to do, you know that that's good and you don't do it, why are you waiting? Get in God's hand. No man can pluck you out of his hand. Get in God's hand. As we close tonight, Andy, you can jump on the piano. Get in God's hand and stay in God's hand. The invitation is open. I'm, I'm going to pray it loud but while you guys can pray quietly. The altar is open. Please come and uh, talk to me or talk to Brother Rick.